Today's guest is joining us from Victoria, BC. Peter Carpenter is currently the head coach of the McGill University swim team, formerly the head coach of the Point Claire Swim Club, a Canadian swimming institution. Now, Peter's had success at multiple levels, every level, I would say, from age group, domestic, international, all the way up to the International Paralympic uh, Paralympics, where he most recently coached a multiple uh, Paralympic gold medalists. The one thing that's been consistent with Peter throughout his career is how he impacts those around him. Regardless of the situation and how, how difficult or dire it may be perceived to be, Peter's got a skill set that's just going to bring you through it. You can call it optimism. You could call it good emotional intelligence, whatever you want to call it. And that skill set has been the thing that's turned the flywheel for every program that he's been involved in. He's built programs that have been sustainable and people have enjoyed being a part of. And today we're talking to Peter about that. So check it out, because chances are you're going to find a great piece of information, a great tip, a nugget that you can take back to your company, your family, your team to make things better for you. Here we go. This episode is being produced by the Ocean Junction Podcast Network. It's sponsored by OceanJunction.com. They have what you need for swimming in the pool, lake, and ocean. All right. So let's jump back into it there, Pete. Nice. Um, so wh where I wanted to start, and I, you heard me mention in the intro uh, the concept of the flywheel, and I want to spend some time really describing that and getting into that, but I want to set the stage a little bit. So um, for those that don't know you um, the way that I know you, um, talk to me about um, like right back to the beginning, where you started swimming, your first coaching job at your first summer pool to Point Claire to McGill and all that stuff. Like take us through it. Okay. So uh, be, I'll be quick. Um, learned to swim in a lake uh, in the Laurentians. Uh, Mum got me involved at Point Claire because I was hyperactive. And uh, I remember the day she brought me in to see George Gate at Point Claire. Uh, the season had already started, but she was like, I got to do something here. And she got me in the door. He did a tryout, gave me a spot on the team. I was seven years old. Uh, so I'm at Point Claire for 10 years. Uh, dealt with shoulder problems at the end. So I quit quite early, uh, but got involved in coaching right away. Coaching came about, I was working at Cedar Park Pool, was my first uh, summer pool job. I had worked up at the Laurentia in the, at the lake in the Laurentians, but my first summer pool job was at Cedar Park in Point Claire. Remember the day that he, George Gate, and Gary Malcolm came to the uh, to the to the pool, and basically were just standing outside the 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 fence watching me coach, which was a little bit unnerving. Uh, and then at the end of the practice, uh, George called me over and uh, and and said, uh, "I want to have a meeting with you." Um, so he called me in. I went to go see him the next week. He offered me a job. I was eighteen, uh, and the rest is history. So basically, just worked my way up through the ranks of Point Claire. Um, started with the 10 and unders, was the head age group coach by the time I was 23. Um, and at that point, I was still in university, but I knew that coaching was my, you know, was my future. It was what I wanted to do. I finished my degree in geography at Concordia um, and then obviously invested all of my energies into, into coaching at that point. Um, was full time the rest of the way through. Uh, became senior coach uh, along with Bill Gate as the head coach when I was 30. Uh, and then f four years later, I guess, took over the head coaching job. No, no, not even four, what, less than that. Maybe 27 and then 30, I think I took over the head coaching job. I was pretty young because uh, I'm now 48 and I'm, you know, I was Point Claire head coach for four years and now 13 years at McGill. So uh, it's it's been, a, it's been a journey for sure. Time flies. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. So George Gate. And keeping in mind, you know, for people that might not know and know the Point Claire story and so on and so forth, what was it like? Or what did you know about George Gate before he came to talk to you? Did, did you know who he was and the impact that he had made? Oh, for sure. Because as a swimmer, he was so ever present, right? So growing up in the program, even though he wasn't coaching anymore, you knew who he was. You knew he was the coach's coach. Um, you, you know, I, I, I was a bit of a swim nerd, so I knew about the legacy and all that. So I, I would have, I, I knew all about that already. Um, but you know, to be frank, I, I had not thought about, uh, coaching as a career up until that point, you know, I liked it. I, 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 but it was just something that I was doing for fun. I think at the time I was probably still thinking 
maybe going towards teaching, maybe, you know, something in, in, in geographic research, meteorology or whatever I was, you know, but coaching wasn't necessarily something I was thinking about. Uh, but he was the one that lit the spark. He was the one that gave me the opportunity. Um, and so, you know, I knew of all of the great coaches that had come out of Point Claire, um, you know, from the, the Johnson brothers, obviously, who are still active, um, you know, through my mentor, Russ Franklin, and uh, then, you know, got my opportunity basically and and uh i'm so thankful to have, have been there at that time had good people around me too by the way yeah <laughs> it was i mean like it's 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 a really special place and i i don't know that um if you never if you weren't there during that era and i haven't been back there in a long time um, still doing good still doing good they they, they they've got a, a great program going still yeah yeah it, yeah so i mean like it's it, it's a really special place when it comes to that because there's not many places where you see you know the commitment from you know all sides administrative financial financial um the you know the community the parents the kids and so on and so forth but i mean yeah. the west island really has something unique with that summer pool system that just feeds it and For it's sure. hard to describe that to people and 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 have them really understand the magnitude and the impact that it has on swimming there. But I mean, geez, it's, 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 it's completely unique. It is completely yeah. unique. There is nothing like it anywhere that I know of in the world. Truly yeah. to have, to have 40 some odd summer pools that all have swim teams of, you know, 50 to a hundred kids in that small an area. Yeah. It just, it's unheard of. I mean, it's just so much fun. I mean, like that's yeah. the thing for kids at that age. I mean, that's really what, what you want from them, right? So, I mean, anyway, so 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 pushing on, you know, when I thought about, you know, this episode and where I wanted to take it and where I wanted to go with it and stuff like that, um, you know, I, I was able, like, this was a, an easier episode to prepare for because I've, you know, known you as long as I've known you. But the one thing that stood out across, you know, every interaction that we've had, you know, friendly, um, you know, the arguments we may have had, you know, now and then, and uh, so on and so forth, um, which, which were, you know, there certainly weren't many of those, but no, um, but they were always, they were always for the right reasons. You know, yes. like I think that, I think that, you know, you're not always going to see eye to eye, but I think that talking it through and communicating and learning and listening, you know, those things are, those things are key. Well, a hundred percent. And, you know, like the, the one thing that, you know, I, I like if if we were all wiped out today and you know the last thought that I would have in my mind and I, I I'm you know hypothetically because of course if we we're all wiped out today I'm not sure that I would think of Peter Carpenter first I might think of my kids first I would I would hope so <laughs> <laughs> but you know in in that hypothetical scenario it's just like this this ability to you know regardless of the situation just find a way to work through it right mm. and um you know regardless of where you start from in every situation and this is my observation you build momentum and that momentum leads you towards success whatever that is for the individuals that you work with mm. so based on how i frame that i mean where like is is that naturally you is that something that you've learned and you know, talk to me about the ability to to really show that level of patience within a situation and work one on one with kids the way you do. Yeah, it's a good one. I mean, I, I think that I really am quite an optimistic person. I think that that I that does come naturally to me. Um, and, you know, I, I think I had a great upbringing. I, I was, uh, you know, I never wanted for anything in my life. And so I was lucky in that sense. Um, was afforded lots of opportunities, uh, whether it was swimming or, you know, going to good schools and, um, you know, never had a hard time making friends. So these were all things that sort of made life easy and made it easy to be optimistic. Um, I thought about, you know, I thought about this, obviously, you know, the, our conversation, you know, leading into it as well and kind of things that I was I would want to say. And, um, you know, I know that based on the conversation we had a, a couple months ago when we talked, you know, first talked about doing this, um, you know, when I was at Point Claire, you know, in our time working together, uh, you know, communication and collaboration, I think really comes down to being big, big keys. And so, you know, when in the club, in the club scenario, 
uh, we had that triangle of coach, parent, and athlete, and and making sure that you're you're doing a good job of communicating in all directions. So the coach is communicating with the parent, the coach is communicating with the kid, and you need to know that the parent is saying the right things to the kid, and so that that triangle is is working well and is in good working order. So that communication and the collaboration and making sure that everyone's on the same page moving forward is good, you know. And and now and I think that that was always. You know, I think back to the time at Point Claire and we spent a lot of time, you know, coaching parents as much as we did coaching kids. Right. It was important to 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 help the parents uh, see the big picture and 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 see what the direction is, what the plan is, where we're going. Um, I think that that's often forgotten. I mean, I think it really is an important skill. And, and it's not to say that um, you're 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 going to need to. Uh, bring things down to a level that other people are comfortable with it's it's about elevating everybody and and bringing everyone to a to a common goal and a common belief moving forward now you know since i moved to mcgill which is you know it's it's un unbelievable that you know almost half my career now has been at mcgill the, the, the parents got taken out of it. You know, I, I started being able to work a little bit more with the team. You know, I'd have a sports psychologist and we have a, a strength and conditioning coach and we have a team therapist and stuff like that. And so, you know, working with an IST team, but we had that, at, we had that, you know, at, at, in different, different forms of Point Claire as well. But now it's really dealing just with the athlete. The parents are sort of taken out of it. Um, you know, I, I do, you know, communicate with parents from time to time, but it's, it's not frequent at all compared to what was happening at Point Claire. And, you learn that coaching the person, right, is so much more important. Having a common vision and knowing that the athlete is seeing what you're seeing and not giving up on making sure that you can get on that same page until you're on that same page. Uh, it's so important because, you know, at the end of the day, uh, swimming's not an easy sport, right? And and if if an athlete's not enjoying it, I mean, I, I, I think back to – if I go back 15 years, 20 years, uh, and the person that I was at the time, I could think of myself as probably being someone who would have tried to convince people to swim. Oh, no, you got to do it. You got to push through. Whoops, that's unfortunate. That's okay. Um, that you have to that you have to sort of push push through and, and get to the other side, and, and, and it'll all be better. Now I, I find myself, if I have an athlete who's an adult, who's a university student, who's got – so many things going on in their life. If they've gone to the point where they say, I don't think I want to do it anymore. I find myself being very capable of saying, well, then maybe it's time, you know, maybe it's time to, to, to phase swimming out and, and, and find a way to find happiness. And I know that I, I wouldn't have done that 15 years ago. I would have been like, Oh, come on, go, go, go. And, and that would have been the, the ultra competitive side of me. And it's, you know, not that I'm not competitive anymore. I'm certainly, I think I'm just as competitive as I used to be, but it's, it's, I've, I think I've found a different way to um, bring people together and, and to bring, you know, common ideals together. And, and that's something that we've definitely worked on at McGill. So I want, there's a couple of points I wanted you to unpack there. So you talked um, basically, so bring it back to you, what you said about coaching the person. Mm -hmm. So, Unpack that for me. And what does that include? And what does that exclude? Well, uh, I can tell you that it excludes do it just because, you know, like just because I said so. Um, you know, you're always going to have athletes that are going to be really amenable and, and that will do everything that they're told. And, uh, and, and sometimes that's great, but sometimes it's not. Like sometimes it's not wonderful to have an athlete that's just a, a robot that's going to do what they're told. It's nice to have athletes with personality. It's nice to have people who have thought about swimming enough to know what works, to know what they need, and to know what they want. Um, and so coaching the person, to me, is very much a, a, a holistic approach. I'm not – I don't look at my role coaching the swimmers at McGill uh, as what is going on in the pool. It's – that is only a portion of what we do. I spend probably more time talking to athletes uh, about life, about classes, about how things are going um, than I than I do about swimming skills. Um, and that's not to say that you know I'm ignoring that stuff, 
but there's just so much other stuff going on in this young person's life. And I think that one of the, and this might be a particularity to, um, to uh, McGill, so many athletes are from away. So many. I would say that uh, on any given year, between 80 and 90 percent of my athletes are from outside of the Montreal area. So their support networks are not immediately available. And so one of the things that I, I do find myself reminding the athletes of is that if they need and I call myself an older adult because they're adults, if you need an older adult, if you need someone to talk to, if you need to bounce ideas off of someone, you need to know that I'm there. And that is, I see that as one of my roles. I see that as an important, uh, you know, part of what I do. And it's, it's that part that I feel I'm working harder and harder and harder on every year. Um, and honestly, in these last two years with COVID, it's been 80% of my work because there was so much time that we were out of the water anyways, you know, and, and it was tough. It was really, really hard for these, for these kids. Um, who, you know, they're all getting towards the end of their swimming careers. You know, 95, 98% of the athletes that I coach at McGill, when they swim their last race at their last U Sports, that's it. That's their last swim of their swimming careers. Um, you know, I could I can count on one hand in 13 years how many athletes I had that kept going that kept going for, well, I mean, a lot of them, maybe more than more than one hand's worth would have finished that season. But uh, in terms of continuing on to swim the following season, less than five in, in 13 years, right? It's just, it doesn't happen that much. So, you know, that you're, you know, one of the things is realizing that and saying to yourself, when they're done, with me i'm their last coach they're moving on into the world they like one of the roles is you're sending them off you're sending them off into the world as as fully formed an adult functional human as possible like that's what you want you want to see them go out there and succeed um and it's not going to be in the pool right like it, it, the success at that point isn't going to be what they're doing in the pool it's going to be what they're doing with themselves so that's the stuff that's really important that's a really, really good answer. So there's a second point, and you kind of got to a little bit there, but I still want to ask it. So you you brought up, um, you know, the importance of getting everybody on the same page. And if we're not on the same page right now, we'll work to get on the same page. Oh. So I guess a couple things on that. Well, actually, no. Unpack that for me first, and then I will go and ask my next question. Well, I mean, goal setting, right? You need to know where what they want to do. You know, um, it's all well and good that I have certain goals and ambitions for the athletes or the team, for that matter. And 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 the team goals are always going to be just a a product of the you know the the collection of all the individual goals that everybody has. Uh, and, and those team goals are are discussed between the coaches and then the coaches and the and the leadership group and the leadership group and the and the team. So those are all sort of formed together. But if at an individual level, you know, each swimmer is going to have a different vision of what they're doing. Uh, you know, I'll give you an example of one of the athletes that we've got right now. Super talented guy, super talented swimmer, and. Um, you know, from the age of 14, 15, 16, swimming was his life. He gave everything for swimming, sacrificed academics, you know, still managed to get into McGill, which is great, you know, because he probably had three, four years there where he had subpar academic results for the brain that he was gifted at, at, at birth. And and that was because he was so wrapped up in, I got to do this. I'm, and, you know, I, I love swimming and I want to have so much success. And, you know, I had a meeting with him. Uh, it was probably halfway through the season where there, there was friction, right? It was, you know, you, you see something and you see an ability and you're trying to feed that ability and you, you have it in the back of your mind that the athlete wants to really succeed and, and he does, but success is different for him. So he, he, he doesn't want to swim the, the, the same events. He used to swim 400 IM, doesn't want to swim it anymore, wants to focus on the, the 50, the 100 freestyle, and, and, and maybe, uh, maybe the 200 IM, you know, that might be an event that we could get to. But, you know, not looking to train the same amount. He is killing it academically, absolutely, almost a 4.0 GPA, uh, and, and heading towards hopefully doing a PhD. 
And, you know, if, if, if you had told me that six months ago, that this guy was going to be doing that well academically and heading towards a PhD, I would have been like, uh, really? Okay. But he's, he, he, his, his, his focus, his ambition has shifted. And, and when I understood that, when I understood that that was what he wanted, I can, I can get behind that. Like, that's okay. That's good because you need to have room for all types. And that's one of the beautiful things about you sports swimming. Uh, you know, I would say, you know, having had athletes that went to, went to the, uh, go, that went to the NCAA, there's more room for people like that. I think in you sports, there's more room for people like that in Canadian university sport in general uh, to have people who are really driven academically and may sacrifice some, uh, you know, athletic ambition for that. Um, and, and we need to have room for people like that. Well, hundred percent. And that's a great description. And you know, there's a lot of good stuff there. Um, you mentioned COVID. How did that change? How you do things? <laughs> a, lot, a lot of this, <laughs> a, lot, a lot of zoom. <laughs> um, uh, it was, it was, it was eternal. It was eternal. It was tough in Quebec, as you probably know. It was lots of shutdowns, lots of time out um, over a two-year period. The ins and the outs. Uh, my, one of my one of my managers uh, referred it to the uh, uh, what was it? The Corona coaster. <laughs> <laughs> it was just the ins and outs of the pool. Um, when we were, well, I'll say one thing. The one of the things I'm probably the most proud of of my team, and and I'm you know. It's, it's funny, we have, we have our gala coming up on Tuesday, so there's certain things that are running through my mind in terms of things that I'm going to say. But one of the things that I'm the most proud of is, is how they responded to the initial really long shutdown, where we were out of the pool for uh, more than three months um, with nothing, no lap swimming, nothing. And just realizing this, right here, there we go. You're uh, <laughs> uh, they, we were on Zoom uh, and we set up a schedule. Savannah and I set up a schedule. Savannah was doing sort of Savannah King, uh, who's my assistant. Um, she was doing primarily the sort of aerobic, uh, you know, exercise classes, and I was doing stretch cords. And we were leading the leading them. It was great for me. I mean, I was I was probably fitter then than I've been in, <laughs> I've been in a in a while, you know. And we were going nine hours a week on Zoom, nine hours a week. So we would alternate one hour and two hours per day. Uh, doing yeah, doing exercise uh, classes on Zoom and having people buy into that and um, and then you know when the pools open back up uh, for lap swimming only, you know got some pretty good feedback. People getting getting back in the water saying you know what I actually don't feel that bad. You know like I feel okay with with my strokes and I I feel pretty strong and um, so you know I was really proud of the buy in that we had and that comes back to the leadership group uh, the leadership group did a really good job the captains and the assistant captains of just keeping people together and keeping them focused and keeping them believing that listen you know we know that things aren't going to be perfect and you know i remember the day that we found out that you know for sure that the 2020 21 season was going to be wiped out um and and that was that was a hard day you know and then um you know, there was a lot of unpacking of emotions at that point because there were people uh, in the group who were done, you know, like that was it. That was going to be their last year. They were graduating and that, 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 that was hard, you know? Um, and then, you know, we coming into this season, obviously it, we knew wasn't going to be perfect. We knew that there was going to you know, still likely be some ups and downs started out. Okay. You know, we got our, we got our first three cup meets, in and then you hit that other shutdown in December and and then we were out for a while and delayed 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 the the restart as a, you know with the that first wave of Omicron as it came through um, and that that sort of put a wrench in things because we had really been building well had great results in the first three cup meets um, team was looking really good and um, we just we we had no no real training options and at this at that point significantly less desire <laughs> uh for doing the zoom like they were zoomed out and they were mm -hmm. zoomed out from from that first stint of doing all of that exercise on zoom and we did we did start getting back to doing some stretch cords but they were zoomed out from classes too like you have to imagine they were on zoom nine hours a week with me and another 20 an hour 20 hours a week with the classes they must have been losing their mind i can't even imagine how much time they were spending on zoom um and then 
yeah, it was just, it was, it was nuts. It was nuts. They were just screen fatigue. Yeah, it was tough. Yeah, fair enough. And beyond that, I mean, I guess from a philosophical standpoint, because you mentioned this when you were talking about where you guys are at now and stuff like that and how your philosophy as a coach may have adapted or changed or evolved and, and whatnot. So I'm not sure if I understand, if I understood it that way, but did I? Well, I mean, yeah, I, I would, I would think so. I, I think that the, the, um, the coaching of the person and, and prioritizing that certainly made interactions and made the ability, like it, it created an ability for me to, to stay really engaged in the downtimes you know, having one-on-one -on -one meetings, um, you know, I, I actually, you know, this is, wasn't with my, my current athletes, but I actually feel like I recruited quite well in COVID and it was all, that was all on zoom too. You know, like there were no recruiting trips. You couldn't bring people in. Um, and you know, you, you get, you get good at having conversations like this, um, and getting to know people and, and getting to, you know, figure out what makes people tick. And it really forced a situation where, Hey, we're, we're, there's no real point talking about swimming right now. Let's talk about you. Let's talk about where you want to go, where you see yourself being, and and how you want to be in the world. And how can I help? You know, basically, that's what it came down to. And there was a lot of time to do that, which was kind of nice. Oh, well, that's good. Certainly a great time for connection if you used it, if you were able to use it. Because I mean, yeah, it's easy to say that. And there's a lot of people that struggled through COVID and connecting wasn't as easy as, you know, we might, you know, it doesn't come down to just saying you're going to do it. This no, for sure. And, and that, so. I think for I, I feel for introverts, right? Like, I think that I think that, you know, being, uh, you know, extrovert plus uh, the way I am, it's not hard to talk. It's not hard to have conversations and stuff like that. But for, for people for whom it doesn't come naturally, that sense of isolation must have been really, really hard. And, and being able to have the conversations, you know, helped you sort of stay alive, helped you sort of feel like you were, you know, still productive, still feeling good about things. Um, but, you know, we've, I'm sure you and I both heard so many stories of the, the isolation syndrome of people just feeling like they were alone you know, and uh, yeah. it's, been, it's tough. been tough. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I want to come back to the flywheel before we end this off and um, just kind of fr frame it and kind of talk about it a little bit more. So uh, the flywheel, if you imagine it, you know, like it's just, you know, basically a wheel that gains momentum, the more and more force it like, gets put behind it. And from this point of view, right, you know, the force is the momentum created by a team or by a coach. And correct me if I'm wrong here, but earlier in your career, the momentum was all peak, like your energy and so on and so forth, right? And as you've evolved and gotten older, you've let other people build that momentum with you. Mm. Is that fair to say? I would say that that's a very fair statement. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, talk to me a little bit about the, like the main differences between, you know, young Pete, coaching age group of Point Claire. And like, I, like, I remember you as a coach before I was a coach when I was still swimming. Right? You were still a swimmer. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, like the energy and, you know, jumping up all over the place and so on and so forth and getting all the kids excited and into it and stuff like that. Mm. So, I mean, like nowadays, how do you get others to gather that momentum with you? And you talked about this a little bit, but I think there's like a deeper part of that. It's, 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 uh, surrounding yourself with good people first of all having a good leadership group it i think it's something that's really um i'm not going to say it's unique because we definitely sort of built sort of team captain type mentality at point claire as well uh, and had you know your your more senior swimmers the ones that were uh, you know that had the voice that you wanted i mean at a certain point there there were some really good swimmers that didn't necessarily always have the right voice uh, mm -hmm. and then there were there were swimmers that may, maybe weren't as good but that had a really good voice uh, that, you know, we're able to bring people along. It's a lot easier, I think, at the university level. One thing that is really, really cool about varsity swimming is that idea of everybody sort of looking in the same direction and, and turning swimming into a team sport. Doing, you know, and it's, you know, at Point Claire, we were pretty good. You know, we've talked about team spirit. You talk about the cheers and you talk about, you know, winning team champs and, and going after the sweep and all of these things that we were able to accomplish at Point Claire those were all team goals as well. But at, 
at its heart, it was always still an individual sport. You know, it was always just sort of the 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 collection of all of the individuals, and and you know that you know amounted to being something really great as a team. At the university level, it's another level. It's it's really you have a vast majority of athletes that are willing to put the goals of the team ahead of their own individual goals. That the, that the team goals are the priority and achieving those are going to be more meaningful than the own, their own individual goals. And, and I would say I've been lucky to have a vast majority of my athletes that sort of fall into that category. And that's the culture. Um, so one of the things that I, I, I'm going to say is a, is a key turning point, and it's, it's actually quite recent um, at McGill, was the, the creation of uh, a charter. We, we put a charter together. Um, it's more than a code of conduct. It's, it's really an explanation of who we are, why we're the way we are, how we do things. And it's something that, you know, new. Sorry, is, is this for the student body in general or just? For the no, 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 no. This is for the swim team. This is specific okay. to the swim team. This is specific to the swim team. And um, it's, I really feel, so we came into play in the 20, in 2019. So for the 2019, 2020 season. Uh, so basically at the beginning of that year, uh, and that was a real turning point year, you know, like we had been improving for sure uh, in the three or four years leading into that. Um, but we were still sort of a distant second at, at the very least to, to University of Montreal at that point. Um, overall, uh, our men were probably competitive. Our women were not really Um and then in 2019, 2020, we put this charter together. We had a really good leadership group um, and everything changed. Uh, you know, we already had a pretty good, you know, look of people sort of everybody looking in the same direction and, you know, having everybody sort of, you know, having similar uh, views in terms of what the goals are, but it, it went to a whole other level. And, you know, when you can have everybody working in unison, going in the same direction at the same time, uh, it's it's a beautiful thing. And and you know, I really feel that that charter got us set off on the right foot. I, I mean, I think back to the the RSQ championships of that year. Um, you know, we knew that our men had a really good shot at winning and actually should should have won. And we were probably going to do a pretty good. We were probably going to win the combined as well, but it was going to be tight. But our women were a distant second to University of Montreal. And, and at our RCQ championship, you know, we had done a good job of, you know, putting people in the right positions in the right events. Um, but, you know, at the meet, there were there were athletes who were literally coming to us with ideas saying, listen, if I sit out this event, I'm going to be able to do this and that, you know, and people positioning themselves, uh, you know, we had athletes just volunteering to, to sit out what they would have been, what they would have considered a main event because they didn't have a chance to score points to rest up for an event where they could sneak into a final and score points there, you know, like stuff like that, that was just, you know, you wouldn't really think of. And, and quite frankly, you know, when, when you're, coaching when you're coaching you you want to coach individuals as well but this thing you talk about the momentum of the flywheel it took on a life of its own they were willing to do anything to achieve these team goals and and that's a beautiful thing in its own in, in its own right and i think that when we won the women's banner that year we beat out montreal basically on the last relay they actually they actually had a, a false start in a four by two of all things jason a oh four by God. two they had a false start and that was it. That was the difference. We ended up beating them by one point. Wow. And, yeah. So it was, it was, you know, and, and that, and that to me is a really good example of where things started. And then from there, it's just been, you know, it carried us through COVID and then coming into the season, it was, it was just, once they could get back to it, it was uh, it's, it's, it's really snowballing at this point. That's amazing. So the, the, I'm not sure what was in the charter, but it sounds like it really had an empowering effect. On oh, yeah. 
I can like, send it to you. I'll, I'll send it to you by email. I actually have a picture of it in my phone. I yeah. can send it to you. And, and uh, it's it's a really, really nice document. It's posted up in the window uh, at the pool. And and uh, we actually took a, another crack at it this year. And, and you know, I, I really tasked the, the, the team leaders now because we were sort of two years down the line. I wanted to know, you know, because I wanted to make sure that this thing spoke to the to the newbies. I want the, the, the charter is for everybody. So, you know, the fact that we had 60% of the people in their first year of eligibility, I wanted to know that they knew this document, but that they had input in the document as well. Didn't change. They, they, yeah. they, I, I wanted, I wanted it to change, but it didn't. So we we've stuck with it and, you know, we'll probably take another look at it next year and, and see based off of what happened this year, which was even better than 2019, 2020, are there adjustments that we want to make to that to sort of set us off on another path that's going to be even better? But, you know, at, cer at a certain point, it's like, don't mess with success, right? They might not want to change it again. They're going to be like, no, we're good. This is working for us. We're just going to leave it. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. So uh, one final follow-up on that. So what was the, you know, what was the impetus to, 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 to create that? Like what drove the creation of the charter? Uh, so at the time, Brad uh, Crocker, who had been on the team, uh, was doing his PhD in sports psychology. Calgary uh, kid. Was, what's that? He's a Calgary kid. Yeah, Bradley Crocker. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Bradley Crocker. So he had been at Calgary. He came to McGill to do his master's in sports psych, swam with us for one year. And then now we're talking about the next year, the very next year, um, he was sort of a consultant with the team. He was a consultant in sports psych and he was, you know, and and it was it was really Brad and the and the leadership group along with me sort of sat down and we we sort of started talking about our 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 ideals you know what do we what do we want to be who do we want to be and how do we want to act um and it started there and then i let them run with it and brad actually coached the leadership the leadership group really were the driving force with the oversight of brad um were set off on a task that sort of brad and i had, had discussed and then they they ran with it um and it was it was awesome brilliant yeah that's awesome i mean like you've imparted a lot of information and yeah so if you do share the charter are you okay if i share it as well absolutely, I mean, like, absolutely. i think it's uh you know i i i have no trouble with as many people as possible seeing it because it, i really think that um you know it, it'll speak to it'll speak to you you'll, you'll you'll see what i mean when you read it there's like it's not complicated stuff it's not rocket science eh? but it, it's it's definitely going to be it's it's one of these things that, that brings people all onto the same page brilliant love it love it i'll look forward to seeing it so well i'll, I, send, it a, a couple I'll of, send it right after i get off with you cool a, a couple of um i guess jovial questions to kind of finish off with Go. so um back to i don't know 2099 you choose the time early pete coaching favorite set oh my god well the one that i probably gave the the most often was and it's funny because this is at a time when I was moving in this direction. I've, I've sort of taken it to another level now. But at that time, I don't know, probably three rounds of 1050s, best average on a minute with four 100s warm down. Something like that. And today, contrasting, Pete, favorite set. Oh, my God. There's so many now. Um, well, I, I've definitely moved more towards quality. So I, I would, you know, like a lot of my sets are based on race speed, you know, just as a small background I, I have less pool time with my athletes than I did with my with my age group swimmers at Point Claire. It's just with the, the workload at school and stuff like that. And so one of the main shifts that I've made every year moving further and further and further down the line of really focusing on race speeds, swimming at race speeds. We do a lot of work at 100 race pace, 200 race pace. Um, I, there's there's a, a 100 race pace set that I really like um, where we do rounds of – uh dive 25 push 25 25 easy 50 back end speed and and do repeats of that maybe eight rounds of that um you know get really good results really high end speed and it's it's not a broken 100 it's easier than a broken 100 um but it's it it's really really working high end quality uh and i would say that that's a lot of the stuff that we do now is just working a lot of high end quality doing lots of race speed i think that you know to be honest and I'm, you know, I'm going to spill the beans if any of my competitors are going to be listening to this, they might know, but uh, I'm going to probably, 
you know, take that and and just shift a little bit, adding a little bit of aerobic taxing before those quality, see if I can take it to another level by getting them just a little bit fatigued and then see if they can hold that same quality. That's going to be like the next step right now. Cool. Sounds like exciting workouts. Yeah, no, it's fun. Oh, yeah, it's 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 definitely high energy stuff. It's it's high energy. It's fun. Um, you know, it's hard work for sure. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, you know, I'll still, even with my hundred, 200 swimmers, they're still averaging, you know, between six and 6.5 a workout. It's not like we're, we're doing 5k workouts every day. They're still getting mileage in, you know, but I tend to do work either at sort of low aerobic technical swimming, or we're going to be at race speed. It's like one or the other. I don't do a, a ton of threshold stuff. Uh, Savannah does. Savannah gets the distance. Kids do it a lot of the threshold stuff for sure. But well, yeah, we we yeah. tend to we tend to focus a little bit more in the mid distance on on race speeds and stuff. Yeah, that's Savannah's cup of tea, isn't it? Oh yeah, she loves those <laughs> sets. Oh my god, yeah, yeah. yeah. No so is she is she in the part of her career where this is like I did this for fifteen years and now no, I'm giving no, it back? She's actually she's actually remarkably good at that because to me that's that's uh, you know it's funny I had a conversation on deck. Uh, just this weekend about this, you know, uh, uh, the idea that there are a lot of really great coaches out there that weren't necessarily great swimmers. Um, you know, I count myself as one of them. Like I wasn't a very good swimmer at all. And I think that part of it is because those people that weren't great swimmers, they got tons of correction. They got lots and lots of correction. So their toolbox is full with all kinds of ways of seeing. And then, and then sometimes there are some, you know, some coaches that were really, really good that do go through that phase of, well, I did it and so can you. And, and, and you know what, Savannah is not at all like that. She's really, really very pragmatic and, and understands the, the team goals and like awesome. fell into it perfectly. Um, so, you know, she's, she's awesome that way. And, and, and that, by the way, that change of, of the aerobic challenge moving into the quality stuff that's a savannah adaption so so like she you know she, she's my assistant but let's be honest she's got lots of great ideas that i'm going to feed off of for sure yeah well i was happy when i heard that you that she got hired there because she's a i mean like i've i've known I, I don't know her really well but what i know of savannah she's a really good person so. oh she's terrific yeah. um so i, I want to finish off by with this one statement and then my final question so um i think drew love is his name uh, from mcgill Drew Love um, was, was my first athletic director. Right. So he brought you on to revitalize and uh, like the entire aquatic program and really put an emphasis on high performance. So, I mean, you've stepped into that role. It seems like you've done a great job. How have you impacted like the direct community around McGill? Are you, are you seeing aquatics and swimming uh, be more present and uh, more is participation increasing because of the work that you're doing there? Um. So obviously I see my role in, in, in two lights from a, from a, from a competitive varsity swimming standpoint, it's going really, really well. And, you know, like I, I I'm, I'm really thankful. Uh, you know, I loved my time at, at Point Claire and I, it's not like I was ever looking to, to leave. I mean, you, you probably remember that time. I wasn't necessarily planning on leaving and, and this offer came my way that was sort of one of those things it's too good to pass up for the family and all that. And, um, you know, I'm very thankful that I took it up because it's it's been such a rewarding experience being there. Um, so, and then, you know, from a results standpoint, yeah, you know, came in, there was lots of changes that needed to be made, lots of um, culture changes. And, you know, I thought uh, just a, a little, a, a quick funny note, um, when I had, I remember having my first meeting with Jeffrey Phillips, who's now the athletic director, but he was, he was sort of director of sports program at that time. Uh, and so I had my meeting with him talking about what my goals were. And I, I basically, at the time I was young, I was brash. I thought I was going to be able to fix everything and, you know, it was going to take no time. And I said, oh yeah, no, I hope to have, uh, you know, both the men's and women's team that were at that, at that point, probably ranked, you know, in the sort of 13 to 15th ranked in the country at that time. I, I was like, yeah, no, I'm going to get them both in the top five in the next three years. That was my, <laughs> that was my first meeting. <laughs> That happened this year for the first time, by the way. So, so it took me thirteen years. It took me thirteen years to accomplish that first goal that I thought it was going to take me three years. So, but we got there, right? We got there, and and that was, you know, that was that was huge. The the the, the greater community, um, definitely. I I do think that um, there's there is renewed interest, and I have no idea if it's related 
to to varsity or not it's it's really hard to to pinpoint we do i do definitely have members of the community often coming up to me saying that they're following that they're you know really proud of the team and oh it's really great that they're doing that. and i'm not even talking about people that are students i'm saying members of the of the community at large too coming in um you know our our masters program in the fall we had 100 participants which was the most we've ever had um so yeah i mean things are things are definitely going in the right direction i think covid was tough um and so it's going to be interesting to see how we can get things back on track starting uh in the fall because i think it'll probably be the fall before we really start doing things in whatever the new normal looks like um but yeah no things are going really well that's amazing that's fantastic well i thank you for your time pete like this has been a real treat to catch up with you i mean i haven't yeah. spoken to you in so long i know and I hopefully i don't know if you tried spoons diner did you get out to spoons i didn't where is it okay so i mean like it's quite a ways from the pool it's okay. down um it's down it's a couple blocks i guess north of downtown right okay so, so if you got a downtown. car so i mean it's on my side it's on my side of downtown yeah 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 so um yeah i mean like i can't remember the exact address but if you google it i mean like it okay. is the best i mean they're, they're getting free advertising here but it's the best it, breakfast spot in victoria so. oh it's a breakfast spot okay it's yeah. a breakfast spot so i'm gonna have to see i i could i could potentially find my way there tomorrow because uh, because Kaylin doesn't swim tomorrow. So maybe I can do that tomorrow morning. Smooth. Yeah, I mean, like, I, I'm sure they're open for lunch. Like, it's a good old-fashioned diner. Like, you okay. go in there, and, like, you know, there's not a healthy there's not a healthy thing on the menu. Right, <laughs> right up our alley, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, hope, maybe I'm mistaken about that, but I never get anything healthy when I go there. Let me right. say that. So. Okay. <laughs> but, um, so, final question. Yeah. Top four favorite... Canadian bands. Top four favorite Canadian bands. Well, Rush, like by far, is at the top. Um, and then I'm gonna have to put Blue Rodeo and Tragically Hip in there. I don't know if they're two three or three four or two four. Um, and then I mean Neil Young, Crazy Horse. I'm gonna have to. It's, I've got to go with Neil Young, Crazy Horse. I don't know if we can count them as Canadian. I don't know if Crazy Horse were American, but Neil Young is Canadian, so I'm gonna give it. I'm gonna give it to Neil Young. I thought for sure I was going to stump you on that question because you were going to have a list of like 75 bands. And you have to go down to <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it, I've, I've seen Blue Rodeo and, and Tragically Hip like, I don't know, 10 times each. So those ones have to get on there. I've, I've never actually gotten to see Rush, but Rush is by far my, my top of the top Canadian bands. And anyone who doesn't put them at the top is not listening. That's, that's my own. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Well, Pete, good luck in uh, Thanks, Victoria man. Canadian Trials and, um, you know, look forward to connecting again soon. Really, really great talking to you, bud. Take care. Thanks, man.